Welcome, everybody. I'm Rachel Chanoff, the director of the Office Performing Arts and Film, and we are thrilled and delighted that you're joining us for uh, this event, which is part of the Arts and Healing Banksicall Virtual Festival, which is co-presented by um, Cambodian Living Arts and Arts Emerson, and it's made possible thanks to the support of the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan and the collaboration of about 50 other artists and partners across seven countries. Um, this panel is about the performing arts dealing with the impact of a global crisis, and it's going to be a contributing event on HowlAround Theatre Commons, which is a free and open platform for theatre makers around the world. You might have joined us for our previous talk, one of our previous talks from the co-commissioners of Banksicall about the development of a piece and how it took um, presenters from around the world to make it happen. In today's event, we're uh, again convening an extraordinary group of pr presenters who are going to uh, discuss the current situation and explore how a pandemic is uh, impacting the global arts landscape. Um, um, we're absolutely honored to have Bill Bragan moderating the panel. Bill not only has a brilliant curatorial practice, Bill, more important even than his brilliant curatorial practice is he is a crucial player in putting together the international ecosystem that really opens our minds and opens our borders when it comes to the impact uh, culture can have on social change and social good. So, I mean, he's worked at some of the most esteemed institutions, Lincoln Center, the Public Theater, now NYU Abu Dhabi, and is a, has had a global influence on how we perceive art across borders. So welcome, Bill Bragan. Great, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Rachel. Uh, it's really great to be a part of this panel. I wanna thank Cambodia Living Arts and Arts Emerson for inviting me to be a part of the Arts and Healing Virtual Festival. Thanks to Plume Prem and Jean-Baptiste uh, Jean Fou. Uh, I'm gonna start by just uh, introducing our three esteemed panelists who represent three different continents. So first up, we've got David House. He's the Senior Associate Vice President of Emerson College and Executive Director of Arts Emerson, Boston's leading presenter of contemporary world theater. Welcome, David. Next up, Emmanuel Hondre, who directs the Department of Concerts and Performances at the Philharmonie de Paris. It's a complex of concert halls bringing music awareness and learning to a diverse audience. Welcome. And finally, we've got Xian Wenping. He's the General and Artistic Director of the Wei Wuying National Cushing Center for the Arts that brings local as well as interna international <laughs> talents to Southern Taiwan. Welcome to all three of you. We're glad to have you here. Hello, Hi. yes. Hi. So I've been a long time fan of Cambodia Living Arts. Uh, I was lucky enough to travel with CLD to Cambodia just over eight years ago when I was at Lincoln Center. Uh, and we were a partner in the season of Cambodia Festival when it first came to New York. Uh, I also had the pleasure to invite Plume to a convening at NW Abu Dhabi that was produced in partnership with Rachel Chanoff and her team at the office, which led to his ongoing relationship with NYUAD. So uh, we're really thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, I've been personally tracking the development of Bunksicle from a very early phase, seeing early workshops. And although we weren't able to bring it to the Arts Center, I'm really pleased to moderate this discussion. Uh, to start off, I have a couple of questions just to set the context. And uh, there's already been a full session with the co-commissioners of the project, and we don't have that much time. But briefly, I was wondering if the three of you could each just explain your relationship to Bangsakol. I know not everyone has presented it yet, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, why you chose to present it and why uh, work that's so specifically rooted in Cambodia's history, uh, why it resonated for you within your own local community. Uh, and I'll start uh, just in the order that I introduced you for the moment, and we'll start with David. Sure. Thanks, Bill. And uh, it's great to be here and to be talking about a project that has uh, such an impact and made such an impact here in Boston. Um, our history starts a little bit back. Um, 
we connected with a project in 2015, 2016 came to our attention and really was for us an opportunity to think about how we use this work to make more connections in our own community. Um, we outside of Boston in a town called Lowell, we have one of the largest Cambodian communities outside of Cambodia. And because our work at Art Emerson is about connecting across difference, we saw this as an opportunity to leverage work and actually engage a community um, that had we didn't have a, a strong and natural relationship with. And so we brought the project in 2017 and were able to present that work and took that opportunity not only to present that work to, but to actually surround it with a number of different engagements that actually started about a year in advance when we actually met and connected with the Cambodian community, many leaders in that community to talk about um, the intent behind the project and their interest in partnering with us. And that developed into rich partnerships that then expanded the engagement work to include what we call a Welcome to Boston event where we have local Cambodian artists actually welcoming the um, artists from the project to the city. We had um, uh, several conversations and local presentations in the Cambodian community around the project and really leverage it as a way to lift up this um, history and compare it. You know, we talk a lot about our common humanity that we share. And many of us in our cultures have had trauma and um, travesties as, as this one. And not to talk about what separates us, but what about these um, uh, incidents actually bring us closer together. And so that work continues and we've continued to track and partner with um, uh, CLA and um, their various projects and very excited about all that comes next uh, for the work. Great, well, thank you for that. And thank you for continuing to support the work and framing it uh, with this virtual festival and bringing it into, into the present moment. Uh, Emmanuel, what about, uh, what about for, uh, for you? The, um, the project in Paris came through uh, Riti because <clears throat> as Riti Pan uh, lives in Paris, um, once he came to us and offered the, the, just the concept, a dream of a, a modern uh, ritual ceremony. And um, for me, I remember the first time we, we, we just imagined how could it uh, take place in Paris. Uh, he had two um, aspects very important and very touching for me. The first one is the same for, as for David, um, connecting um, the performing arts and the Cambodian uh, community in Paris. <clears throat> in fact, this community is very silent. Um, we had very um, a, a, a numerous number of people coming in the 70s, uh, just after the, the genocide. And since that time, in fact, uh, the French people and the other communities don't know so much the Cambodian uh, history, values, uh, beliefs, and, and so on. And for me, it was a, a huge opportunity just to give them a chance to be a part of the, um, the global community uh, circle um, we are used to invite uh, as guests in the Philharmonie de Paris. And the second one was the 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 multiple angles of that project. I mean, um, when Riti was dreaming of his images um, connected to music, it was something very unique because usually you use images and you try to connect. And the way he, he was uh, considering images and music um, as two major and important um, actors, but not serving one to each other. Um, the poetic um, power of the images was great because it's, it was a mix of um, uh, strength and um, violent images of lack of humanity, uh, but also very poetic. And you couldn't make your own advice very quickly when you consider his images. And the music on the other side was very peaceful. And I remember that strange mix. And I was totally convinced uh, immediately by this. And until um, 2018, when we uh, hosted the, the project in May, I kept that feeling to have a very strange mix of 
strength and peace. And I understood at the end, at the very end, when I was totally um, transformed myself by the project, but I, I realized that the other people were also transformed deeply by the project, were changed, were moved, that we had a very special experience. In, clearly, it was a way to make peace after the war, after the genocide, to find, um, to come back to humanity after a lack of a humanity, to mix modernity and to pay attention to the tradition, but a living tradition, not something fixed and a piece of history, something like a body, you know? And um, for me, it was clear that it was another iconic experience showing that the Cambodian people um, don't live in their past, but build their own history with the others, with never a kind of conflict, but looking for peace. Um, I'm not a religious people. Um, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but, um, but I believe in spirit and in human spirit. And this show for me was very, very powerful for that reason. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and now, when Pin, my understanding is that you have not yet presented the piece, uh, but clearly uh, it, it made sense to, to bring you into this conversation. Uh, so I'm curious why. What's your relationship with Bunsicle and how does this uh, resonate with, with you as someone who's not yet presented the work in this community? Uh, yes, I was in, introduced in, in this project uh, back in. 2014-15 season uh, when I act as a consultant to our Ministry of Culture. Here at that time, so they have built a Southern East Asia Committee and they are, uh, and they are pushing a project named uh, Rainbow. So just want to, to build the connection with, uh, between Taiwan and Southern East Asian countries. And uh, and in, in that case, I was introduced uh, to, to this project and immediately I was so attracted by, 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 by this program because, because uh, as I see the, so this requiem, uh, I immediately remember, remember so Taiwan's own history because uh, so I, I remember uh, what was happened uh, in the forties uh, when when the Chinese Chinese government uh, earned back Taiwan from Japanese, and unfortunately uh, in around uh, 1948, uh, 47, 49, 48, it was a <laughs> tragedy happened in in Taiwan. So we called it two two eight. So th that event was uh, that incident was happened in uh, on the twenty eighth of February, and everything was because of this a cigarette. So a cigarette seller. And so, and and she uh, she she caused uh, some some rumor, and 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 finally, so the, the result was the Chinese uh, Chinese military uh, came into the town in many towns in 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 Taiwan, and and some so unfortunate <laughs> happens, and so many 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 people dies, and uh, especially intellectuals and artists. So and and when I when I see this project, this program, uh, this this requiem, I immediately think about it because this is also an issue that's so until now. So now in 2020, we are still fighting with this uh, hist historical event. So how we we should see this and how we should evaluate and how how can we carry it uh, into our future. And this is one part, and another part is uh, how we, uh, how the Aboriginal people in Taiwan, so live, so in in our society. So they they have been always uh, be underrated, and just in the past uh, twenty or thirty years. So we we started to the artists started to 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 know so more about our, our uh, Aboriginal arts and performing arts and try to 
to uh, to take take the elements to 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 our works and so so for uh, because of these uh, two reasons so i i think this should be should be significant for us to present this work in in taiwan and unfortunately the national kaohsiung center for the arts so uh, should be open in 2016 but due to some construction problems as usual and so we we finally uh, opened in uh, october 2018 but uh, I, as I remember, so back in 2016 or 17, so we, we did a tryout performance in Taipei, in, in the Taipei National University of, uh, of Arts and uh, sung by Taipei Philharmonic Chorus. And many people was there. And so they are so, so impressed by, by, by this work. And now, so we scheduled this program uh, to, to be to be presented in uh, 2022 uh, in in our venue in National Culture Center for the Arts. Right, that's great. I'm glad that you'll finally have a chance to present the work. Uh, and what's I think what's really striking about all three of your answers is that sense of how how so much of the resonances of Bank Circle are very specific to your local to your local circumstances and your local histories uh, and your local communities, but also really do speak to the commonalities as well, uh, especially in relationship to the historical trauma. And we are living in a traumatic time right now under the kind of under the uh, under the global pandemic of COVID. Uh, but it also is hitting uh, different parts of the world in really different ways. And, uh, and so again, to provide a little bit of a context for our viewers, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about uh, what is the current circumstance in your local community in response to COVID. Uh, and now that it's depending on where we are, roughly nine months to a year since, since the pandemic emerged, uh, what was your, what was the immediate impact to your work at, at your art centers? Uh, and how has that evolved over time? And let's go in reverse order uh, and start with uh, Wen Pin. Uh, yes, uh, we are we are very lucky. So thanks to to our, to the effort uh, uh, effort of our our CDC in Taiwan. So because uh, we had uh, experience with SARS uh, back in uh, uh, 2004. So now so people are some uh, somehow we are prepared aware about uh, about the virus, and when it appeared, so our CDC react very fast. And the result is that, uh, and certainly we we have uh, we have we have also experienced a difficult time for performing arts, uh, from I think from March to May, and then we are so we are so lucky that uh, already at the beginning of June, so the government announced that so now we can do performances, and uh, but step by step. So first, so we have to to do a separate seats. And very, very soon, so already from the beginning of July, so we are allowed to sell the full house performances. And, but even though, so during the difficult time in March, uh, from March to May or even June, so we, we, we tried many things. And thanks to the construction to, to our venue, uh, the Wei Wing National Cultural Center for the Arts, so we have a lot of public space, which is outdoor, but with under roof. So we are able to contain our, our our program. For example, so the monthly dance program outside, and 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 also so we we offer uh, we 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 turn the live performance to online activities. So already at the beginning of April, so we start uh, we initiated a, a, a project named a musical offering. So we took uh, uh, the famous theme from musical offering by Johann, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, and we encourage people uh, both in Taiwan or abroad to make improvise, make their own version of this work and put, put, put them all on YouTube. Well, thank you. And I'm curious, Emmanuel, uh, 
on the kind of more general contours, how much does that track what has been happening in Paris? Uh, I know that there's, there's, there's been some opening and closing and, uh, and I'm curious uh, without maybe as much detail on the, on the programs, but in general, what are, what are you seeing uh, happen within your institution and within, uh, within the kind of the arts in, in France overall? Uh, you're right. We stop, we start, we stop, we start, and it's horrible since last March. Um, what we learn from the crisis is, as French people, that we are weak uh, most of the time because um, it's not easy for us to be unified and to have a consensus when we have a crisis. So musicians, especially, were... Um, living in a kind of um, fragile context because um, we lost music on the on stage. Um, it was not easy for them to to be together and to and to ask together to live differently. So they spent in March, April and May months being um, separated from it, uh, each other and then without music. And then after three months, they realized, but it was very late, that they have to um, resist and to keep music alive. And then we work with them and we work together. And I think um, this crisis learned how to be together more, even if time were very difficult. And for, for the French people, it was also something important, uh, uh, an important time to show how music can make sense for the society. Um, art, many artists are waiting for the, the audience and the people to come to them and to listen to them. And in fact, they don't know their audience. They don't know the people uh, attending their concerts. And now I think things have changed because um, when music was stopped, they just had to ask themselves, okay, uh, if I really need to be as a musician on the list of the necessity, on the um, priorities of the nation, what can I bring for the people? Um, not only being on stage and offering music, but what sense does it make for the others? Um, can I be a part of the of the global efforts and how. And they, they were not used to think like this before. Um, and I think it was a, a good um, um, consciousness, a global consciousness. Um, in September, October, we had more hope after the, the summer, of course, and, of, and then um, we are back in the tunnel. We are still don't know in, in one week we can start the concert or not. So. Okay, we are back to the tunnel. But we kept two symbols and we thought we need messages. So I observed that many concert halls uh, want to, wanted to be safe and to be focused on um, important and major masterpiece or pieces of arts. Um, our choice was to put contemporary art first. And we kept two operas. One was in October, Licht by Stockhausen. It's a crazy uh, experience. It just, you know, Licht, it's a, everybody dream of um, having Licht one day, but uh, nobody achieved it, in fact, because it's too long, too expensive. But we, we just resisted and um, we kept um, Montag. It was just, uh, no, no, it was Diemstag. And that crazy opera and the, the name Licht was a way to bring light to that terrible moment. And the second opera was an opera by Du Sapin, um, a recent one uh, composed three years ago, Penthesile. It, it was also a kind of myth and very dark, black, black, and the music was black. So. In that context, we had light and darkness um, in the same month. And I think it was a way to 
to be like uh, in Alexandria, um, to show something like a candle somewhere, a big candle and two candles. Um, and everyone can make sense its own sense with these operas. Um, at the end, if I try to, to understand what I um, learned from that uh, pandemic, you know better the people now. And probably it was also the same thing with Bang Sokol. Um, during a war, during a crisis, during a strike, during a, something difficult for everyone, you know deeply the people after that or during that. When life is easy, <clears throat> in fact, you don't know the people. You, you know, uh, people can be superficial or just um, the outside of the people. But in the crisis, you know, inside. Great. Well, thank you for that. And there are a couple of things that you alluded to, especially in terms of the, fr the fragility uh, of the artist and the audience and some of the themes that I'm going to want to circle back to. Uh, but you opened and you talked uh, in the beginning about uh, about the kind of the divisions within the society and how people were uh, yeah. were responding in different ways. So that feels like a good uh, segue to go to the United States and to uh, to Boston. So David, uh, how about uh, how about things sir, around Emerson College? Sadly, um, uh, the the segue is appropriate um, in the sense that we struggled with how to respond. It's not that we didn't know the answers, it's that we struggled to figure out what was the right answer. And so we find ourselves still uh, quite compromised in this moment. But our um, moment of reflection and pivot happened in back in March, March 13th, I remember the day. And we had heard news earlier that things were happening, but on March 13th, we had to send our entire team home to start working in a new normal. Um, this was a time of incredible anxiety and unrest. Not only were we trying to keep and maintain the sanctity of the organization and the mission of the organization, but we were also very mindful of the impact on our team, the impact on our artists and the impact on our audience. And so because our orientation as an organization is around civic transformation, around being a, 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 a useful tool, for the city to transform itself, we had always had a focus on the people being sort of people-centered. And so in this pivot, we went home and the truth is we thought we would be back in like two weeks. So we literally just left everything in the office. And in fact, we have a, we, St. Patrick's Day is in March. I think we still have St. Patrick's Day decorations in the office right now. Um, so we literally left thinking that we would be coming back in two weeks and realize that this is gonna be taking very much, uh, much longer time. So after we got off over the initial shock, we started to think about how we needed to pivot. And so we as a team engaged um, a, a, a recovery model, which is basically five phases. And this gave us a framework because in this moment, it was easy to focus on all that we were losing. And we were losing a lot. We were losing revenue. We we were losing audience, we were losing hope, but we did not lose our spirit. And so we thought we could actually look at this moment as a time of incredible tragedy, which it was. And we could also look for the gift in this challenge. And we started to think about the triage. How do we immediately safeguard our people and our um, institution but also while looking at the future. So we thought, up, thought about it like as a, as a hospital, like triage, but you also think about the health and wholeness of the body in the future. So we were trying to do the triage, but we're also at the same time thinking about a new future. We knew that we didn't want to go back to the good old days because in our country, the good old days were not good for everybody. And so we wanted to make sure that we were moving into this new normal, leaving the dead bodies, leaving the things on the other side, but bringing all that's fresh and new and really reimagining how we can be engaged differently with our community, how we can really elevate the artists as gatekeepers of truth, um, words by Paul um, Robeson, keep them at the center of this um, uh, sort of moment so we actually were in the midst of a show. We had to cancel the show. We had two more shows in the season. We decided as an organization to continue to pay those artists, even though we had to cancel the show. That was very important to us. We know that 
artists are not necessarily considered essential workers, but in our minds, they're quite essential. And we wanted to make sure that as much as we could, that we could support their efforts. And then quickly, we thought about this recovery model, which I'll go through quickly, which is basically five phases. It's first to clarify the situation. That was our triage moment. It's then to talk about mitigating. So what are the immediate things that we need to do to make sure that people are safe, to make sure that our artists are um, uh, uh, secure, to make sure that we can keep things moving, and then redeploy is the third phase of that recovery model. What are the resources that we've been pointing in one direction that need to quickly shift in a different direction? That's both financial resources, but it's also human resources. How do we pivot our staff to actually be thinking about a new way of delivering um, the work that we do? Then the fourth phase is to reinvent. Um, the actual recovery model says that the fourth phase is recover, and then the fifth is reinvent, and we inverted those because we wanted to reinvent our future before we recovered to it. So we thought about, okay, what is this new normal and how do we navigate? And like everyone else, pivoting to the digital platform, and we can talk about more, more about that. And then our hope is that we will be able to recover, not necessarily bringing all that we had in the past, but recover into this new normal. And so our team has really been focused and thank goodness for sound organizational culture that's been able to help us connect and stay connected to each other in these vulnerable moments. We are still not able to convene. And in fact, we as an organization have decided that we won't try to return to live experience until the fall of 2020. And even then, we are unclear how quickly people will want to come back into the um, theater. We're also clear that not everyone will come back at the same tempo. And so we hope to maintain our digital platform because even though we are planning for live experience at the same time, we're planning as a companion, but also as a, you know, a seventh venue for us to maintain that digital um, presence so that we're having basically two conversations that are going on uh, with our audiences. Um, so that's sort of where we are in the moment. Um, and it's very unclear. We know that the pandemic and the, it will be darker days before they become brighter in spite of the fact that the vaccine is coming. And so we're, we hold on to hope and we keep moving forward as we deal with these incredible times. Yeah, it's interesting. So much of what you say resonates with my own experience at the Art Center at NYU, where especially the redeploying, we made a very similar decision to commit to an entirely online fall. Uh, and what we found is the roles of everybody within the organization actually play out differently as you go from an in-person event to an online event. What does front of house mean? What is the role of an usher? What does your production staff do? Uh, when there's no lighting, how do you redeploy the lighting team? Who within the tech, who within the technical production might have marketing experience? So I have different, different work, I think, uh, hits different people within the organization in, in very different ways. Uh, the other thing that, that you mentioned that really resonated was about uh, when, you, when you led with the fact that you paid out the artists whose shows were canceled. And I think that was one of those things that I noticed right away. Uh, as soon as the COVID uh, pandemic became clear and the severity became clear and venues started closing, dates started canceling, the utter vulnerability of the artist community became crystal, crystal clear and how precarious people's existences were and not just artists, but everybody who makes their living, managers, agents, technicians, uh, you know, uh, front of house staff, all of them were, were caught up in that vulnerability. So it leads me to the next question, which is about as you're doing the triage and as you're looking at the different strategies, there are so many different stakeholders that a performing arts organization uh, is trying to account for. So your artist community is one, your audiences are one, your institution, both the parent institution and all of the people that you work with every day, uh, as well as your funders and all of your, whether it's government partners or donors or so on. And so I'm curious, building up, David, on, on what you said, maybe for Manuel, how did you balance all of those different stakeholders? And are there other are there other stakeholders that you were really considering in your action plan as you responded? Very, very important question. Because I think if you compare uh, Boston and Paris, the situation, the understanding um, of the situation is very different. We always wait for from our government um, to how to act and we don't 
look enough for our own um, uh, responsibility of acting ourselves, depending on the general rule. But in that situation, we were waiting for rules during weeks. So in fact, we had no choice. We have to react immediately. Um, we more or less, we, we had to change and to sh switch, uh, as you explained, David, uh, exactly to, uh, to support the artist uh, to save this and this and to um, keep some resources uh, and to send this and this. So in two weeks, it was, um, we were ready and we were so surprised to be ready. But on the other side, um, we also realized that uh, to have online um, activities was very important to keep a, li a, a link uh, between communities. But it was very, very difficult to, um, to find something human in this new technology because um, you mentioned institution, um, audience, artists, they were not used to be together through technology. More human, more uh, artistic link, human link, uh, physical link. Um, so we had to learn something different, a, a new process and still being human and not being too, too um, efficient and with a lack of humanity. Um, that was something very difficult and still I'm looking for a better situation because I feel that, for example, my team is somewhere, but we came back to our own lives without feeling now, how is the global um, goal, um, spirit, uh, experience, um, it's difficult for us to, to be together in the same time, really together. Um, because you separate so many things uh, when you answer, when you write, when you talk. Um, okay, you can talk at a, uh, some meetings, but then you lose the people and you lose the, the flavor of the collective group. Um, when you are in the same place, audience, artist, or team of an institution, of course, you, you feel so much. Uh, you communicate without words. You see yeah, there's body language every, everywhere. You have a kind of a breath, a common breath. This common breath was um, invisible. I don't know if it disappears or not. I don't know. I still don't know. And I also feel many of my colleagues <clears throat> they lost um, convictions. Um, uh, uh, they didn't trust um, in what they were believing in before. And um, that's a big, a, a huge responsibility to, to try to find this common spirit back. Uh, I like, uh, David, when you talk about uh, the new normal. Um, <laughs> Um, interesting question. Um, the, 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 the last normal doesn't inspire anyone. And we also realize as we, we are still dreaming of something more intense, more equal, more uh, appealing to something uh, not better, but uh, different and change, but what we want to change, not what we are asked to change, but to, to take the responsibility of the change, uh, of the, yes, to assume a choice. And that's, I feel something very important for the artist, even for the audience. Now they want to choose because uh, in, during the crisis, you don't know, you don't follow the, the global rhythm, the global energy, the global process. You are more, face to face to your personality, identity, choice, and then uh, you have a real part of the process. So perhaps more than before, because we are during the crisis. And then um, I felt that before the, 
the process, the um, yes, the process was stronger, and the people perhaps weaker. Now it's the opposite. I think that the conversation about the new normal, some people have been talking about returning to normal while other people, especially uh, during, the, during the height of the summer, certainly in the US when uh, the, Black Lives, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was really, uh, was really expanding and expanding globally, there was also a lot of calls of saying no, return to normal is exactly wrong because that normal was broken. Uh, and so now there is there is this reinvention of finding new ways and and navigating and identifying where those where those failures were within the systems. Uh, I think because Taiwan has recovered more quickly uh, and is is into kind of you were talking earlier, Wenpin, about the multiple modes in which you're working, where you are gathering audiences in person together at full capacity, you're still doing online work. And as you're at sort of a different phase from the other two panelists, I'm curious how you're thinking about uh, which projects belong in what, in what context? Uh, are there different intentions that you have as you're programming now uh, in kind of in the wake of COVID? How is that affecting your artistic choices as well as the sort of the strategies of how you present something and how you, how you speak to your audience that, uh, that is different from what you did previously? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, so even though that uh, in Taiwan is, uh, uh, with fortune that uh, we can do performances uh, as usual but still so uh, the foreign artists are not so free to come here because we we we, we keep this uh, 14 days quarantine policy and and it makes uh, our arts markets uh, not so funny because uh, because the arts markets so you need some new elements so you, you you cannot always see the local local groups, local programs, you, 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 you always want to, to see what's, uh, what's, what's different uh, from, from abroad. But, uh, but in now, so we are forced to, to face this situation. So, and, and we, are, we, we are also uh, glad, so that we are encouraged, uh, not, uh, not only by ourselves, but also from our supporter. Uh, what I mean is uh, so our government, the Ministry of Culture. So now we we would like to reinvent uh, invent so how the local groups they can grow up, so to grow up grow into this new normal, uh, because so we we cannot uh, still live in the old, uh, good old days. So what what they always do the traditional operas so they, uh, what how they always do so now we have to so we are we are forced to to think and to to invent something new and uh, probably with uh, technology and but also from from the spirit so how how we can so how how we evaluate now the world and so where can we put ourselves in in the new world but as a conductor i i still have to say so so I miss the so when I think uh, thought uh, think back in in, in March uh, until June. So I, I I was also giving a concert without audience. I I, I miss the the uh, this is not only about the connection between musician for or in my case musician and the conductor, but also we want to feel the, the breath from the audience. I think this all together make us so and make our old life beautiful but I, I still think so in even in a new new normal probably in two or three years so finally we will well, we still have to 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 take take back these old good things but in the same time so we we also so we also open an opportunity to 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 find or to search a new possibility and to embrace 
something new. For example, the 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 use of the technology, especially now in Taiwan. So the the so the government is pushing very 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 hard to 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 install the five G. Uh, environment, and and I, I believe that so we can do something with this five G technology to to make the all, all this uh, AR uh, AR VR stuff so more human. I hope, and and so so this is what I feel. Great, uh, and and I think that really speaks to. Yeah, you know, the magic. The thing that we're all missing is people who've committed their lives to creating events that bring audi audiences and artists together in a shared space at a shared time, and that exchange of breath, which is what we live on, and is actually where the risk actually literally lies right now. Uh, and in a piece like Bangsako, which really draws from the idea of a requiem and a collective ritual and the importance of that to art, uh, as we're looking at substitutes and online and AR and VR alternatives, uh, are there strategies, and I'll put this out to any of you, that you've employed to somehow replicate or create a new version of community, a new sense of the presence of the artist and the presence of the audience in a shared space and in a collective experience. Uh, are there some, some things that you've done that, uh, that you say, yes, this is actually a key to how new work might be created in the future going on that you, that you want to pursue even further? I'll say that I'll start, um, Bill. I, I will say that we are very much experimenting with all kinds of new forms. One of the, um, uh, uh, important activities of our organization is it's supporting artists through residencies. And we've done that mostly through our physical spaces. We have several spaces and we invite artists to come into those spaces to actually develop, you know, uh, uh, rehearse, do whatever they need to do. And in this new moment, we didn't want to give that up because we, but we went to the artists to say, what is it that you need in this moment? And some artists, as you might imagine, quickly said, okay, these are the tools I need. Many said, I need more time. Some are still thinking about how they plan to operate in this in this kind of new um, uh, digital space. But we have found some successes and an opportunity to connect artists to communities in ways that we hadn't actually explored. It's not that Zoom and Skype didn't exist pre-pandemic, we just weren't thinking about it in this way. And for example, we hosted a, a fundraising event where we invited probably 15 artists from around the world who were delighted to be in community with our artists. They came to the event online and then we broke them out into small groups at tables with the various um, uh, staff members, as well as artists, I'm sorry, as well as our audience. And they were able to engage in a rich dialogue of what's, what they're challenged with, what gives them hope. And the artists were able to speak with the audience about what they were looking for. So there was this wonderful exchange. I can't say that a project developed out of that, but certainly there's something about that human connection. And I would uh, uh, echo what Wen Penn said about there's something quite powerful um, about the power of awe and the experience of vulnerability in that moment and how we're opened in that vulnerability to connecting across difference. And so part of what we're challenged by and have an opportunity with all the wonderful technology is not how do we look at the tools that we have, but what are the tools that we haven't developed yet in our sort of technology world that we as an arts community are on the forefront of. We are part of that um, ideation phase and not the you know, recipient of it after it's developed. How do we think about technologies that don't exist that allow us that human connection even across the digital? And I would say that it is not our intent to say we're completely going to digital because again, as humans, it is our instinct to be in community to connect with each other. And that's part of the beauty of what we do is the gathering and the convening. And so we certainly wanna to return um, to that aspect of it. But when we return there, we don't want it to look the same in our um, country. And so many of our venues, the audience is homogenous and you don't get that brilliance. You don't get that exchange that we are so desperately in, in need of. But we've, we're trying to figure out by following the artist's instincts around what are the tools that are going to be needed to actually create that kind of connection, 
create that opportunity to develop new work and push the boundaries and ask new sets of uh, new sets of questions. And so for uh, for the other two panels, for Manuel and Wenpin, are there some tools or strategies to use the tools that you've employed that have been successful in trying to transform uh, that experience for your for your audiences? So and so as successful as our so our situation in 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 uh, COVID nineteen uh, in in Taiwan, but I do. I do find out something. So that's the, the artist and uh, the arts group. So, so now they are, they real they they recognize that. So some some essential element uh, of uh, what they are doing. So because I I, I feel that uh, before COVID nineteen, so they used to to stay in a room, and so we we want to compose, we want to create new things, and the, and. Um, and uh, they are not always thinking about the audience, so uh, which means uh, who uh, the, the people who who are who who will be seeing their work. So they 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 usually don't care. But uh, through this COVID nineteen, so I I, I do uh, find out that so now they they really care, and they want to they want to make steps to to the to to the people, to, to, it, to the audience. Now, so as a uh, center for the arts, so we supported artists, so a lot of artists, and especially in COVID-19, so we supported so more than 50, uh, 50 groups so of, of, of artists. And now we saw everyone, they, they, they want to go to the people. So not not like before. Before there, there was a, ah, I want I want this. I I need a room and I need this uh, financial support and I need this uh, te technical support and uh, we want to we want to create a great job, uh, great work. But now no. So now they they ask for for help. Can you support me to let let me find out more uh, new 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 audience? I want to be close to to the people to the community. And so, and, and we are very happy because we have so so many programs with with community, and now so they are so they are willing to do to do everything with us. So for connecting the community, and and I think this is great, and and I, I really hope that the artists they they also learn from 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 this COVID nineteen experience. That so so to, to know what 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 the essential of arts performing arts. And, to share. And, yeah, and Emmanuel, what what have you what have you done to tap into that sort of essential that essential role of the performing arts, and what's what's mm. activated here for audiences? Essential, I don't know, but in fact, as we lost many concerts, we felt so ashamed by this situation that we it was a kind of necessity to create something new for the new normal life. And uh, if I take one or two examples, um, we saved um, in March and we postponed the, uh, a new competition for conductors, for uh, women conductors. For France, it was very important because um, we don't have that tradition of um, affirmative action or this kind of um, to support equality so much uh, because we believe in the quality of the Republic, which is um, more or less uh, achieved, achieved, but we, we, we feel it's enough. But in fact, the classical uh, field suffers a lot. Um, and especially composers and uh, conductors are very unequal. So we decided to work um, as we have no concerts, more on that community. Um, how many uh, female conductors exist? How do they work? How do they learn? How do they uh, uh, talk? Um, and I think it was very, very fascinating uh, what we knew from that experience because during five or six months, we were, uh, we devoted a lot of our time to this new project it was the first edition of that com uh, competition, but also I created also an academy. Uh, we also created a, a network 
uh, a kind of alliance between uh, uh, Romania, the US in Dallas or in, in Baltimore with Marine Elsop. And, uh, you know, the, usually I, I don't have that time and so much time to really go deeper in the subject and to try to help so much. So it's a, a kind of example of, I hope, a, a piece of the new normal future we can have. Um, because especially we don't want to come back to the situation before, which is so unequal. Um, and it, um, technology also help us to be more international. Because usually when we work on these communities and these uh, challenges, we are too European or too national, but not enough international and global. And it's so easy and it's so quick now um, to do this kind of uh, meeting like today, uh, even to work um, quickly like this. And I, I feel uh, guilty because I didn't do that before enough um, because I thought it was so important to come myself and to spend time and to socialize and to know better each other. Of course it is, but in the same time, um, we are less efficient perhaps and less powerful if we wear so much from the physical reality. Um, sometimes you can be more efficient and, and, and direct uh, with the new technology as we do today, probably. Um, can you imagine if we would have imagined to come to, I don't know, uh, uh, all of us to Taiwan or to Paris or to New York? Wow. Uh, you wait and you wait and you it's a huge investment and so on so i think it's it's not bad to try something different and to go deeper um in our beliefs yeah i think that that that's been something i've been thinking about a lot the fact that here we are in Abu Dhabi and in Taiwan and in Paris and in Boston and in Cambodia and in New York. And we're all having this conversation that we could have easily had through this very same platform a year ago, but we wouldn't have done that. Uh, and I was in, I was actually in Melbourne at Asia Topa uh, at the end of February this year. And it was just as COVID was emerging there, but also, all the Australians were talking about uh, all of the fires and their country has been burning and the environmental impact of the kind of work we do and the fact that the discoveries that we're making right now under the most tragic of circumstances uh, are actually offering us opportunities to deal with the fact of the environmental the environmental impact of this kind of transnational work, the limitations of borders and migration and visa issues and lots of different obstacles. And so there are things that we're gaining. We've lost an enormous amount, uh, the most important being the incredible numbers of human lives that have been lost to the disease. Uh, and that's something that we need to hold to the center, but also uh, how can we transform? How can we be resilient? How can we take this moment and hold on to what we learn and what we can grow from and what we can turn into something else? And I think that uh, this conversation and this festival has been a good example of that. I think Bunsicle and the work of Cambodian Living Arts continually speaks to how, uh, how trauma can be transformed into art of really profound moving depth. Uh, and so I want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts. I wish we had more time, uh, but uh, thank you all for being here with us. Thank you to Chen Wen Pin. Thank you to David House. Thank you to Emmanuel Andre. Uh, and I want to now uh, turn you over to uh, the producer of Bangsakol again, Rachel Chanoff of the Office for Performing Arts and Film. And thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to our brilliant uh, panelists who are all such forces in our cultural landscape, global cultural landscape. So thrilling to hear you all think this through together. So, um, and just to, to echo what Bill just said, it's so crucial to find the opportunity in the crisis and what we'll all take forward. I know we've all been talking always so much about access, 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 and usually we're talking about 
price when we talk about access or do people feel comfortable in our esteemed venues as access? But this has been, as everybody has evidenced, a real moment of instead of bringing people to the art, bringing art to the people. And I know that's the kind of access that we'll take with us when this crisis has abated. So very interesting thinking. Thank you all. Our next event is you'll hear and see new works that were made specifically for this festival. Um, and then we'll have a discussion with the next generation of artists. So please, you know, stay tuned for the grand finale of the festival. And you can also go to banksicle.cambodianlivingarts.org uh, to view this, this, uh, this panel and everything that's happened at the festival, all the, all the panels. And you'll also find information about um, Arts Healing 2020 Challenge, and we invite you to join that. So thanks again, and we'll see you hopefully at more of the festivals.